Good morning and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Dave Deacon, and we're coming to you from the research station near Altus, where it's been an interesting year for crops in southwest Oklahoma. And with more information on the 2016 cotton crop, here's Randy Bowman. The good news is that, you know, actually this year we have a, what I, I believe, and, and certainly the USDA National Ag Statistics Service believes, is a record crop. It appears that in spite of the fact that we set a record crop last year uh, in terms of per acre yield across the state at uh, 874 pounds, it appears that NAS has our average set this year at about 960. So, I mean, that is a huge, huge uh, departure from the, the crops yield uh, compared to what we've seen even in some of the better years prior mm -hmm. to 2011. So you know we're really proud of the fact that we've had some really good opportunities this year to to do what folks in this area do best and and that's to focus on on making a, a really really good cotton crop. So what has really been the difference? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's been the moisture. Well certainly the moisture has really had a huge impact on this. I know We've always had some issues in the summer in terms of getting over the hump, so to speak, in July and August. And at least at Altus, we received uh, about four and a quarter inches of rain in, in July, which really helped a lot of our dry land in, in a lot of the areas. And also in the uh, month of August, we received uh, basically normal precipitation too, I think around three inches or so. So if we couple that with our irrigation capacity, of course we had, um, Lake Luger, north of town, basically went over the spillway again this year, which is really good. And so we had plenty of irrigation water and really probably didn't necessarily need to use uh, as much in uh, this year as we would in a normal year because we had you know the good supplemented uh, rainfall from Mother Nature. So uh, this, this rainfall distribution in picture really extended across multiple counties and especially into our, our, our heavily dry land counties and so we're going to see a lot of dry land producers I think this year set some records there's no doubt uh, well over two bales I haven't heard of any three bale dry land fields coming in but I would not necessarily be surprised to hear uh, some of that I know that in in general our better yields in the irrigation district here have been in the four bale per acre neighborhood three to three and a half is pretty common uh, we did have some back bacterial blight issues that affected the production in some fields, not necessarily all fields. Uh, uh, but, you know, in general, we're, we're optimistic that we're just going to have, you know, the best year ever. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you were actually able to plant a, a, in, in a more timely manner and harvest has already started. Yes, we, uh, we actually kind of had two planting windows. We had an early May window. Uh, we kind of got into trouble mid-May with some really low temperatures, but that early May planted cotton actually did very well uh, at the end of the day. And a lot of the cotton that you see here that, that's, that's not been harvested yet, this was planted a little bit later into May. And uh, you know, I don't know what percent harvested we are right now in the Altus area. I wouldn't be surprised if we're not 30, 40% maybe, something like that. And that's pretty good for the first week in, in November. In November, yeah. absolutely, you bet. And, and the reason why was because we had a really nice dry October, fairly dry. From a cotton perspective, that's always a good thing. We had extremely warm temperatures in, in the month of October too, which really allowed some of this late cotton to uh, fully mature. And we're expecting uh, from the classing office to see, quite honestly, I'm expecting to see some records in terms of, of our fiber properties again this year. We did have some records last year that we, we basically tied a record for staple length. We, uh, we set a record for fiber strength, and we also set a record for fiber uniformity. And I wouldn't be surprised if we don't uh, uh, break some of those records again this year. And you sound so much more optimistic, I'm going to say it one more time, than you did back in 2011. Oh yeah, just no comparison. It's, uh, it's just, we've really been blessed again. And you know, this is two years back to back. Mm -hmm. uh, so the good Lord, you know, works in mysterious ways, and uh, I guess he kind of gives us maybe what we deserve. I don't know, but <laughs> anyway, it is, uh, it's a real pleasure to have a crop that looks like this. Uh, and be able to set records two years in a row. Okay, thank you much. You Randy bet. Bowman, Extension Cotton Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Hi, I'm Hal Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. This has been one warm, dry fall. 
The last day in October and the first day in November were short sleeve, no coat weather days. The afternoon high air temperatures for mesonet sites on the last day of October range from 82 degrees to 92. It made for one warm Halloween. The bare soil temperatures at 4 inches showed how soils were holding on to the heat. Half the mesonet sites had three-day averages for November 1st at or above 70 degrees. The lowest three-day average soil temperature was 63 degrees at EVA in the Panhandle. Looking back at October, our average air temperatures for the month were 4 to 7 degrees above average. Northern and central sections of the state, the yellow-orange areas had the largest departure from average. That has pushed crops like cotton to harvest ready maturity. Those above average temperatures for October came from warmer daytime temperatures that averaged 4 to 11 degrees above the long-term 15-year average. For October, the 4-inch soil temperature below bare soil ranged from 2 to 8 degrees above the long-term average. Here's Gary with a look at October rainfall and its impact on drought. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Well, it's no secret that October was very non-Octoberish. We got very little rainfall, lots of heat, and that drought intensified across other parts of the state other than just eastern Oklahoma. So let's take a look at that latest drought monitor report and see what we have. Well, as we can see from the latest U.S. drought monitor report, that drought is starting to spread from northwest Oklahoma to the southeast, and we're also seeing spread from that drought in southeast Oklahoma up to the northwest. In between, there's an area of abnormally dry conditions, not drought yet, so hopefully we can get some rainfall in here, and those two will never meet in the middle. Now, the culprit was that lack of rainfall in October. If you look at this uh, percent of normal rainfall map for October from the Oklahoma Mesonet, you can see all those reds and oranges those are 60 to 40 to sometimes less than 20 percent of normal rainfall for the month of October, so certainly no good news there. Now if we take a look at the latest uh, November temperature outlook from the Climate Prediction Center, it shows greatly increased odds of uh, above normal temperatures for November, so they're expecting a continuation of that warm October uh, to last into November as well. The U.S. monthly drought outlook for November, therefore, shows that drought across the eastern part of the state either intensifying or persisting or even developing in other parts of that area. And the drought up in northwest Oklahoma is also expected to either persist or intensify. So not good news if these outlooks come true. So even if November does end up being warmer than normal, that doesn't mean it can't get cold, it can't rain, it can't snow. Uh, and we might even see drought relief. We'll just have to wait and see what that day-to-day -day weather brings. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. This week in Vet Scripts, we look at the number one reason for condemned cattle at slaughter, bovine leukemia. From time to time I get calls about bovine leukemia virus. Bovine leukemia virus is a virus that is capable of causing cancer in cattle. There are different names for this disease. Enzootic bovine leukosis, malignant lymphoma, and lymphosarcoma are all different names for the same disease. In the U.S. it's estimated that about 44% of all dairy cattle have this virus and about 10% of our beef cattle. It is the, lymphosarcoma is the number one reason that cattle get condemned at slaughter. Now, the way cattle are infected with this disease is through blood transfer. So, when we use contaminated needles or dirty instruments, uh, palpation sleeves over and over, this allows for us to transfer blood from one animal to another. Now calves may be actually infected in the uterus or during the birthing process. And we do think that insects may play a role, although the evidence to that is lacking. Now there are three possible outcomes once an animal becomes infected with the virus. The most common outcome is these cattle are normal and healthy and do fine the rest of their life. Another possibility in a, in a small percentage of these animals is that they will always have 
If we do a blood test, we'll always have a persistent high white count, and that's because their lymphocytes are always elevated. Now, in less than 5% of the cattle, they will develop cancer. And the symptoms you're going to see with this are going to be a wasting disease. They're going to, they're going to lose their appetite. They're going to lose weight. You actually may see lymph nodes that increase in size. Uh, if the tumors infect the spinal cord, you'll see some lameness or paralysis. Or if it infects a specific organ, you may be see clinical signs associated with that organ. Diagnosis of this disease is through the blood. Since we have no vaccine, any animal that comes up positive for the virus has the virus. But we do need to keep in mind, just because you have the virus doesn't mean you're going to get cancer. There is no treatment for this disease. Uh, if we want to prevent this disease, it all revolves around preventing the transfer of blood, changing needles in between each cow, making sure our instruments stay clean, change palpation sleeves regularly, keep our calving areas clean. If you feed colostrum, if you will freeze it or you will pasteurize it, this will inactivate the vaccine and also controlling insects may be beneficial. If you'd like some more information about bovine leukemia virus, please go to the SUNUP website. Cattle prices have been improving the past couple of weeks. Joining us now is Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist. And Daryl, give us an idea of what's been going on. Well, it's been a really tough fall for cattle markets. Uh, we've we've been, uh, you know, really lower than usual. The market's been very skittish, I guess is one word, or or, or really kind of uh, scared this fall. Uh, but we finally appear to have put in a bottom, and it's across the board. We've seen feeder cattle prices improve the last two weeks, fed cattle prices, box beef prices, uh, pretty much across the board. We finally seem to have sort of broken this berry psychology and and uh, and put some support into this market. And is this typically what you would expect to see? this time of year? Well, in terms of prices going up, especially for feeder cattle markets, we really wouldn't think so. You know, we're right in the middle of the fall run of calves, if you will, or normally would be. We certainly have more calves this fall. Um, but, you know, because prices have been low, uh, we have not seen, uh, you know, maybe as many come to town. Uh, obviously, one of the things that has happened is that we have not had good stocker demand this fall uh, because of kind of the fear in the market. Uh, and, and the support we're getting now is kind of counter seasonal in that I think we're seeing sort of late development of some of that uh, stocker, stocker cattle demand. And then with all this in mind, what have producers kind of been doing in terms of marketing their calves this time of year? Well, obviously, because of the low prices and, and producers really hoping to see this market bottom and, and improve a little bit, I think some producers have held on to their calves and are still holding on to their calves. We generally have, and this is not just in the southern plains, but really across the country, we've got pretty good forage conditions and, and lots of hay in many cases. So I think there's some calves that are still out in the country that maybe they will come to town a little bit more in the next two or three weeks, but I think some of them are going to stay in backgrounding programs. Here in Oklahoma, again, wheat pasture demand didn't develop like I thought it would or Earlier this fall over the last six or eight weeks but I think it's going to kick in now we still expect that a lot of this wheat that's out there is going to get grazed so that's again part of the support we're getting in this market despite the fact that we're moving into sort of the heart of the fall run of the calves okay Daryl Peel thanks a lot we'll see you again soon We've had an unusually warm uh, fall so far, but it's inevitable that once we get around the first part of November, we uh, enter that season when we'll get those uh, nighttime frost and eventually a, a killing freeze. But when we have those light frosts, we need to understand what effect it has on these forage sorghum type plants, especially if we're going to uh, run some cattle out on those fields uh, or, or pastures where we've had uh, something like some hybrid Sudans, Sudan by sorghum uh, hybrids, even uh, uh, Milo stocks. If that plant hasn't been killed yet by frost, but it gets affected by a light freeze to where we uh, have some change in the metabolism of the plant, then a couple of things can happen. Number one, it may continue to accumulate nitrates out of the soil, but due to the stress of the plant, it can't convert it into protein. And so we have a buildup of nitrate after that light frost. 
We need to be aware of that. If we're going to uh, utilize those plants out here to graze with, with cattle, then certainly we want to wait a full week after a killing freeze, one that totally kills the plant, and then let that week go by, and we should be reducing the risk of the nitrate uptake. The other side of the coin that is just as dangerous, perhaps even more so, is with that light frost, we can change the metabolism of the plant and break down the cell walls to allow the production of what's called hydrocyanic acid, and most of us just call it prussic acid. And that, when consumed in uh, uh, small amounts by the livestock, can be pretty deadly pretty quick. Another part of that story that we need to remember is, again, with that light frost, the top part of the plant may have been damaged, but then when we get some warm days, we'll start to have some tillering or suckering, and that regrowth is potentially some of the highest that we can have in terms of prussic acid pr production. So, at this time of the year, if we've got some of these forage sorghum plants that we plan to graze, I certainly would suggest that we be very, very careful about running cattle out there when we might have a light frost, and if we do, stay off of those fields until that killing freeze has happened, give ourselves a full week so that those plants totally desiccate, dry up, and are dead without any regrowth, then we can reduce the risk of either nitrates or prussic acid poisoning. And if you'd like to learn more about those two particular maladies that we really concern ourselves with here in Oklahoma, I suggest you go to the SUNUP website. That's sunup.okstate.edu. Look under show links. We've got the link to the fact sheet that discusses nitrate toxicity in livestock and prussic acid poisoning. Uh, both of those be very, very helpful and informative for you. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. We're here with Dave Lawman now, and Dave, we just heard Glenn talking about prussic acid and, and nitrate concerns. What are some alternatives in terms of forage that producers can be aware of? In the case of prussic acid, it's pretty simple, and that's, you know, if, it's, if we're talking about standing forage, you need to just wait and wait that week time period out, and, and it's, it's fairly simple uh, to, to get beyond that, that time period. In the case of nitrate toxicity, or, uh, let's just talk about harvested forage that, that you're concerned has some substantial nitrate. Um, you know, the documented level that causes concern for cattle in general is about 5,000 parts per million. And beyond that, you start to get higher risk of abortions and, and other problems. So the first thing would be to have, have a pretty good idea of what concentration you might be dealing with. And so you're going to have to seek out a commercial laboratory uh, that has the capability of giving you, you know, a, a, a test so that, to give you a concentration. The other thing you can do about that is you can gradually increase exposure to the high nitrate forage and cattle have the capability of in improving or increasing their tolerance over time. Now, since we're talking about forage and maybe the, the lower quality forage and this time of year it's always important to talk about supplements, what kind of advice do you have producers this time of year and kind of what new things are on the horizon? Well, here we are in early November, so hopefully people are starting to provide, particularly in, if you're talking about standing forage or uh, native range, prairie hay, for example, it's going to be low in protein. So people have probably already started or should be starting their protein supplementation program for the year. Uh, we just thought we'd show you a relatively new development in, uh, in that area, cow supplementation, and that's this distiller's grains cube. We've done a lot of research here at the Range Cow Research Center with distiller's grains, and uh, this company has started to produce a, a nice three-quarter inch cube, range cube, out of mostly distiller's grains. So it's going to be 30 to 33 percent protein, 
uh, 9 or 10% fat, somewhere in that range, so high energy and high protein, and it has the convenience of the cube form. And as I can tell, the, the cows seem to like it. <laughs> they, they do. They're big fans. Um, so the, the, the other interesting thing, and, and maybe you can show our, our little demonstration here, but we just measured real quick a small batch of these cubes to see what degree of fines we might be getting because if you're feeding something on the ground, you would anticipate the more fines in the cube, feed or cube product, the more waste you might have. Uh, we measured these, this product here this morning and it was about seven and a half percent fines on a weight basis and so that's that's really good it, particularly for something that is this high in fat because fat does not make a very good pellet it's kind of mushy and doesn't let things stick together very well so that that's a that's a pretty unique development and a nice nice invention okay dave woman thanks a lot we'll yes, see you again soon thank you since we're talking cotton this week, Kim, let's talk about the price of cotton. Well, you look at the uh, cotton futures price, it's right at uh, $69, $68.80, somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, the range is mostly from $68 to $72. If you look at the support prices on that December contract, uh, you've got weak support at 68 and you've got probably strong support at 66 uh, dollars since september 1 it's been between that uh, 66 and 72. so it, what's what, what's the overall movement in the cotton market well if you look at the cotton market i think the reason it's moving is because of cotton production around the world uh, you look at right now the USDA has world cotton production at 102.7 million barrels. Uh, the the five-year average is 115.4 million, so below average there. Foreign production 86.7 million barrels. They average 102.2 million. China oh, around 21 million barrels. And of course that's the gorilla in the closet here. Uh, they're below average. Uh, their average is 30.8 million bells. India, another big producer, 26.5 million bells. Their average is 28.9. So all of that is below average. You look at the United States, uh, 16 million bells. Our average is 15.9. So we're right at average. And I understand Oklahoma is uh, above average and that we've got a good crop going. Let's talk about wheat right now. Where are we at with the price? Well, wheat price has just been wallowing around. They've been in this, this same location since August or so. You look at the December futures, uh, $3.95 for support, $4.24 resistance. Uh, you look at our cash price, it's uh, you know, $2.90 to $3 will get the cash wheat price around most of Oklahoma. Let's talk about the value of the dollar nowadays. Where is it moving? Well, that's what uh, most people have been talking about since there's not much else going on in the market and that value of the dollar is going to impact both cotton and wheat prices. It's down around uh, 97.23 uh, uh, as we're talking right now. Uh, it's uh, got up to $99. Everybody was getting concerned about it and talking a lot about it. It's got support at 96.9. You know, we've been that, that uh, index has been between 95, 96, and 99 for about the last six, eight months. Okay, thank you much, Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. You know, one of the things that we got to think about and one thing that we live we live with here in Oklahoma is wildfire and wildfires can occur pretty much any time of year but the biggest majority of our wildfires that we have in Oklahoma typically run from around November to March the winter time when when fuels are dormant vegetation is dormant and we get a lot of drier humidities and things and that's when we get a lot of the big wildfires is typically during those winter months. And so coming into the winter, it's things that we should think about on how we might want to protect our home and protect some of the things on our property from wildfire damage. Several things that we can do to protect our house, you know, the best that we can from wildfire. One of them is to make sure we mow that, mow that lawn there at the end, get it really short, keep the grass down around it real short, keep grass around our, our home and stuff short as far out as we can get it. 
Also, again, if you have a lot of trees, hardwood trees that drop their leaves, make sure you go ahead and rake those things up, remove those, don't let them build up around the house or underneath the house, underneath your deck or things like that where fire and embers can get in and, and cause that kind of damage. Because the thing we need to remember is most home damage that occurs with wildfires typically occurs after the fire front passes by the house. It's from smoldering embers and stuff that are landed in flammable materials around the house that start the fire. One of the most obvious things is if you have a fireplace, wood burning stove, and you stack wood up on your house. Don't stack it. It's very convenient to have it stacked on the back porch by the door, but think about if embers get in that, that can cause a fire. Another thing that we can we should consider is in areas where we have where in areas where we live where there's a lot of trees and stuff around our home is to make sure we have stuff cleaned up around it. We prune those trees up where we don't have vegetation and, and stuff limbs all the way down to the ground. Also in areas where you have a lot of eastern red cedar, you want to get those back away from the house, cut those things down, get them totally removed so they're not a fuel hazard. Uh, <clears throat> kind of like this setting that we're at here, these folks had a concern about their house being so close to this area here with a lot of trees, and historically it had a lot of cedar trees growing up in it. They come back in here, remove the cedar trees, open it up. If any kind of fire comes through here, it's going to stay on the ground. It's not going to be a crown fire, a big hot fire coming up against their house. It'll be easier to put out and easier to protect that home. Yeah, I'm thinking about removing the vegetation, picking up around the house, making sure everything's clean. That way you can protect your house. It'll be easier for a fire department to come to protect your house in case of an emergency like that in a wildfire. You know, less flammable stuff that you have around it, the better off you're gonna be. Well, that does it for us this week on SunUp. If there was something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. And while you're there, check out our social media. From Altus, Oklahoma, I'm Dave Deacon. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.